as we come toward the end of our study of urban geography, we need to examine one more model. This is really a riff on the von Thunen model. Do you remember the von Thunen model? It's related to agriculture vis-a-vis -vis the location of a city or a town. Take a look. Now, remember, intensive agriculture was closer and extensive agriculture was farther from the city. This next model that we're going to look at is an updated and modernized landscape model based on the changes that cities and transportation have gone through over the last 75 years. Keep in mind that when von Thunen proposed his model, which was based on Northern Germany in the first half of the 19th century, there was little to no urban growth going on in those little farming towns and villages in Northern Germany. So the relationship between farms and cities would have been different from what it is today. The idea for this alteration of the von Thunen model came from Robert Sinclair in 1967 when he published Von Thunen and Urban Sprawl in a geography journal. According to the model, the value of land for land's sake, along with the potential value of specific plots of land in the future, have become the fundamental influencers of land usage. In other words, the land has value as a future commodity, not just as something that can produce food. Speculation, meaning investing in something with the hope that the value of that thing will increase and thereby provide a profit on the original investment, is now the primary determinant of land usage according to the Sinclair model. That renders the von Thunen model and the von Thunen concepts of economic rent or economic rent meaning the value of agricultural products along with transportation costs moot. In other words, not valid. Who does this speculation? The landowners, the farmers, developers, middlemen and middle women, real estate agents, investors, all of these things. Ultimately, their goal is to subdivide the land and make a profit. Subdividing or a subdivision happens when a larger tract of land is purchased by a developer who then breaks that larger parcel of land into smaller parcels of property, builds houses and or apartments or condominiums, and installs infrastructure like streets, electricity, water, sewage, gas, and perhaps recreational land like a park, depending on the strength and requirements of the city and the urban planners who operate in the city. And then that developer sells each of these lots, the parcels, the houses, the apartments, the condos, to individual buyers. The land goes from being owned by one person, the farmer, to eventually, after it is developed and subdivided, to being owned by many people. Take a look at these diagrams. I know they're not great, okay, but just take a look at them. You can see that that big rectangle is either agricultural land or vacant land. Then it gets subdivided. And when it gets subdivided, it gets turned into houses, and in this case, a park. You can see it goes from one big plot of land that farming's going on to 16 houses and a park with streets and everything else that would go along with a modern division of the landscape. The von Thunen model concept of land use patterns changing with distance from a city are still valid. But according to Sinclair, instead of high value intensive agriculture being located right next to the edges of the city, his research suggested that either extensive agriculture or vacant properties were located immediately outside of the last urban or suburban zone. I want to note that his research was focused on the Midwest, places like Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, the eyes. If you look at our local area, Southern California, Southern California was once a leading agricultural area in the United States. Think about it. There's an abundance of flat land. There's an abundance of fertile land. The climate is conducive to growing crops year round. There are acceptable water resources, the Santa Ana, Los Angeles, the San Gabriel Rivers, along with a lot of groundwater. And there's easy access to transportation on both the land and the sea. Where is 
all of that farmland today, it's under the city, under houses, streets, highways, malls, and strip malls, factories, businesses, schools, parks, football fields, and so on. As the city grew outwards, mostly from LA, but from all of the many urban nodes in Southern California, Long Beach, Santa Ana, Pasadena, Torrance, Corona, and so on, the farmland was slowly converted to an urban and suburban landscape. Remember the ribbon development model and conurbation? So there we have the city and then we have each of these modes of transportation that lead out of the city. And as that happens, the city expands outwards along those transportation corridors and it connects other cities together. That's conurbation, the grouping together of cities due to massive urban growth. There you go. This is what happens. Sinclair was examining what happens to the land that is right next to the growing metropolis. For example, in the areas where you can see I put those yellow arrows. What is the uses, usage of that non-urbanized land as the city encroaches and nears? Does it remain doing what it had been doing with regards to farming or does something else happen? Today, urban land is almost always more valuable from a pound for pound or acre for acre perspective than rural land is. So urban land is more valuable than rural land in most cases. If a competition for a specific piece of land, say a thousand acres, arises between a farm and suburban development, the land will be worth more as a suburban development. It can be sold for more money and create a bigger profit, in other words, than can be generated by a farm, just like what happened with Lakewood and many other places in Southern California. Lakewood was once mostly beet farms and swampy land. So what is the farmer going to do? Sell the land to the developer, who will then subdivide the land, build houses, and then sell those houses. Meanwhile, the farmer, that's right, meanwhile, the farmer, if he, she, they wants to continue to farm, moves farther away from the city, buys land where it's cheaper, keeps the profit from the sale of the original farm, and goes back to farming probably waiting for a similar scenario to play out again. This happened in the 1960s and 1970s with dairy farming in Cerritos, Artesia, and La Palma. Take a look at this ad in the Artesia Advocate from 1963. Here, I'll read it. Then, agriculture was a splendid use of dairy land just a few years ago. Now, today, your Dairy Valley property can be profitably sold and highly developed if it is properly rezoned. And look at what it turns into, the modern world. So you go from farms to urbanization. That's what that's trying to tell you. Kind of wild, isn't it? It's really kind of exciting in some ways. Not necessarily always in a good way, but it is kind of exciting. Now check this out. This is in Cerritos around 1970 at the corner of 183rd and Bloomfield, before there was the Cerritos that exists today. Here is the same corner now. What happened to those dairies that were in Cerritos, Artesia, and La Palma? The dairies moved out to Corona, San Bernardino, Bakersfield, and Tulare. Now in Corona, there's increasing pressure to sell the dairies because not only is the land more valuable because of urban expansion, because of urban sprawl and subdividing, but because the local residents don't like the smell and the flies associated with the dairies. Look at this one. Can you see where this is? Where is this? There's the Disneyland Hotel in the background. And you can see that there is a strawberry farm in the foreground. This photo is from 1990. I took it. It was for my master's thesis. That was one of the last strawberry farms in Orange County. There's still one or two, I believe, today. Once Disney acquired it, that land became this. A parking lot in the parking structure. You can see that I circled it on the on the left hand side in red. And then the massive parking structure that Disney has. The expansion of the urban structure is admittedly generally haphazard. As the landowners on the edge of the city in the current agricultural land do not necessarily all sell their land to developers at the same moment. So there's a bit of a slow filling in like a patch patchwork quilt. But eventually, it all fills in, right? According to the Sinclair model, a farmer at a distance from the city that is great enough so that the land is not likely to be encroached upon in the near future would be more likely to be willing to engage in the costs associated with intensive agriculture. Lots of capital and or lots of human investment, but lots 
of or high valued agricultural produce on the land because it remains cost effective at a distance. Whereas a farmer that's being surrounded by a growing city might stop spending money on farming and wait for a high offer for his, her, their land. Thus, either allowing for extensive farming or letting the land sit vacant. It may be seen as pointless by the farmer and or the landowner to continue to invest in something that's going to be sold relatively soon for far more money than it's worth in farm produce or ag land which is a factor of sale value of the agricultural product minus the cost of production. In other words, it's not worth the effort anymore. So the farmer speculates on the farmland, waiting for a high offer for the land. In his model, which looks very similar to the Von Tunen model and makes similar assumptions, it's a model after all about flat landscapes, rationality and so on, the concentric rings have very different activities happening in them than they did in the Von Tunen model. The area immediately adjacent to the city in Sinclair's model. So the city is the large black dot in the middle and the land right next to the city is in blue. The assumption is that the blue land is already beginning to be converted to suburbs or is being held in speculation. Therefore, it's either vacant or engaged in factory farming like poultry or pork raising and processing or greenhouse farming. Just beyond that zone, the purple circle is an area of unused or marginally used land that's characterized by cattle grazing and or hay farming that's used as animal feed. Grazing is uh, in this second zone is as much probably for weed control as anything else. The third ring from the city, the third ring out from the city, the cream colored ring on this model is land that's understood by the owner to be in line for subdivision and development in the near future and is used for moderately low cost extensive farming and grazing. Dairy farming and other intensive forms of agriculture are in the fourth ring, the bronze color on our version of the Sinclair model. There's a realization that the urbanization is coming, but not anytime soon. In the last ring, the green ring here, Sinclair placed extensive grains and fodder crops. In this location, the market is national or international as much as it's dependent on that local urban center in the middle. And the area of, or the idea of, of urbanization is kind of way out in the future, if at all going to happen. Sinclair recognized that this would not play out with perfect regularity and reality. It's a model. What is important to understand is the pressure of growing urban to suburban landscape puts on the nearby farmland by elevating the cost of the land. In reality, along the fringes of a city where it's likely to be mixed land usage that trends over time towards urban usage, the growth of the city will almost certainly be in fits and starts. If you live in Orange County and take a look at the landscape as you move about the area, you can see barns in the back of houses, long lines of eucalyptus trees that were used as windbreaks for farmland, funky large lots and small lots mixed together, regular patterns of orange or grapefruit or avocado trees that spread from lot to lot, and weird distance intervals between the streets. Have you noticed this? Like, especially between the lights, sometimes it's one mile, sometimes it's half a mile, sometimes it's 250 yards. It's all from the random subdivision of the county as it was succumbing to urbanization throughout the 20th century. If you think back to the to near the beginning of this class when I talked about sequent occupants, this idea that different people use the same land differently through time, the landscape that we currently have in Southern California is directly tied to that previous farming landscape that then slowly converted piecemeal to an urban and suburban landscape. But if you look closely, even the name of the county that the college is in, Orange County, gives you an idea you can see on the landscape bits and pieces of the world that existed not that long ago.